Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. Today's guest, legendary drummer for the Eagles, Joe Walsh, and many others, Joe Vitelli. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everyone? Rich Redman here. This is another episode of The Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. We talk to authors, comedians, thought leaders, business people, musicians, even drummers, lots of drummers. As always, my co-host, you can see him right there in the red and black closet. That's yeah. Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com, 20 years in radio, amazing voiceover artist. He's been known to play a little bit of drums. And uh, we're into our 60-something episode here. Man, this is incredible. Well, by this time, maybe even 70-something. Yeah, I know, which yeah. is like, you know, and I say this about all of our guests because we love to celebrate everybody and shine a light on them. But this is really is a real treat today. And I met, I met this young man years ago, maybe, God, coming up on 10 years ago at a rock and roll fantasy camp. But he is a household name of drummers, just the folks that he's backed up. I'm on the iPad looking here. This guy, wow, Ted Nugent, Joe Walsh, Dan Fogelberg, Pete Frampton, Pete Frampton, the Eagles, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I mean, the list goes on and on. And then recordings, Rick Derringer, Ringo Starr, John Lennon, Keith Richards, a bunch of hacks. My friend. Who are these people? Drummer to the stars, Mr. Joe Vitale. How are you, bud? I'm good, man. Good to be here. Yeah, you're coming to, you, uh, coming to us from Ohio, right? Ohio, yeah. O yeah. Ohio, born and raised. Born and raised. Yeah, man. I love those stories where you stay in your, in your place your whole life. Well, I, we, I skipped out a few times. Uh, you know, we, we lived in uh, Colorado when we first moved out of Ohio just to start the Joe Walsh band. Yeah. Because uh, he wanted to live in Colorado, so I followed him there to start the band and everything. But, um, and we stayed out there for about three years, but then we, we came back to Ohio. It's, it's home, you know? Yeah. That's beautiful. So this is just, I mean, obviously, if you're listening to this, uh, usually people will take us on their commutes or take us to the gym, but uh, it sounds like you're listening to us uh, between the bedroom and the bathroom. And who knows if you even made the effort to get dressed today. Yeah. <laughs> but um, So tell us uh, how it all started for you. you were, we're looking at like maybe perhaps five decades of drumming, which is incredible because you think about all the people that pick up a pair of sticks that want to do this thing you made it happen. I mean, in addition, you're a musician's musician, you're a singer, you play flute, you play keyboards, you compose. How did it all start for you? Well, um, I was born in a, into a musical family. And, um, you know, my father was a musician and my brother was a musician, my older brother. And um, I started taking lessons, uh, drum lessons when I was six. And a lot, of, a lot of guys did start that early. And it was good that we did because, uh, you know, it's a good age to start anything. You really get into it, you know, and you're not distracted by a whole lot. And so by the time I was about 12, I had six years into it. Uh, my dad um, had a, a band and uh, my brother played in his band. And I then I was became the new drummer in his band. So it was a family. Band. It was a family and affair. Yeah, family affair, and we played, the, you know, we played the weddings and parties and, you know, whatever kind of, you know, dances and stuff. And um, and uh, we did that. Uh, that started around, nine, probably around 1960, and uh, I was 11. And, uh, and then in 1964, I watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and that was the end of that. And uh, it was the end of my dad's polka band. And... <laughs> Uh, it was pretty rough to quit your dad's, when you're Italian, you don't quit your dad's, dad's polka band, you know, <laughs> so, um, so I, I, uh, got together with these guys and started playing rock and roll in 1964. Nice. And so, yeah, and everybody talks about that seminal moment, the Ed Sullivan show. You must have been maybe like 14 years old every, or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I was 14 when they were on Ed Sullivan and, um. Uh, Max Weinberg's only a, a year or two younger than me, and he says the same thing, and he, he talks about the same thing. That moment was like, it, it you know, it, it, it was a, a, a changing life moment, you know. And um, when we saw that, we, you know, we uh, we knew what we wanted to do. And um, uh, fortunately, being blessed to be able to do it all these years, uh, we look back and and 
I wouldn't change anything as far as my decision goes, you know, watching them that night on Ed Sullivan and, and my father was watching as well. And he goes, Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> so, uh, and it was, you know, it, you know, the Beatles won. So, um, uh, my father always used to say, cause my father was a jazz musician. My father sure. used to always say, those guys only know three chords. And I said, yeah, but dad, they're the right three chords. <laughs> so we, we had arguments for a while and, um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think my dad was appreciative of me doing what I did until, you know, eventually a few years later, I was on TV and all that. And, and you know, I mean, then, then your dad goes, well, that, that's pretty cool, you know. And, and so, so what was that? What but, was that, Joe? Uh, that you... uh, we did uh, with, uh, with uh, Joe Walsh, we did um, uh, the Johnny Carson show. And uh, we did uh, all kinds of shows. And, um, um, you know, it seems like once, you know, by the time we were doing that professionally, you know, and there was no more Ed Sullivan. There was no more, you know, a lot of the rock and roll shows back then were gone by then. But um, right. the Tonight Show was happening. And, and um, uh, so, you know, I guess when you, in my dad's eyes, you know, he probably thought, well, that's pretty cool. You got to be on TV, you know, so. Yeah. It was cool. It all ended up really good, you know. Sure. Well, I'm, that's so cool that your dad got to see you and your, you know, your dreams come to fruition. And it, yeah, it's so funny. Like you got to meet my folks at my last drummer's weekend in yeah. Nashville. And they were just like, oh my God, it was like a, it was like a love affair. And you got to meet some of my great students, Sarah, Cardiel and everyone. The kids just yeah. loved you, man. What a great, great time I had that weekend. That's such a great thing you do. And I hope I can do another one because that was so fun. And uh, the people were great. A lot of great drummers showed up for that. Yeah, we, was, yeah we had Larry Aberman. We had Daru Jones. And then all the yeah. kids, you know. the kids it, was are, it was tons of fun. The kids are good these days, man, because they, they, they have, have the world at their fingertips. I mean, we used to have to drop the needle and hope that the needle wouldn't skip while we're playing along. And You know, that's, that's a, such a good point, Rich, because, you know, they, they, if they're studying a drummer, I mean, you just go to, go to YouTube or whatever, and you can, you can get lessons. Besides that, you can watch live, live stuff, and you can actually see somebody do something. We had to, like you said, we had to listen and try to imagine how he did that drum mm -hmm. fill or how he did that footwork or what have you. Now you can actually watch it. And yeah. uh, it's very helpful. And uh, yeah, they're, they're kicking butt, them young kids, man. Totally. When, did you, when, when did you start listening to cassettes, Rich? I mean, that, that came out in the late 70s, right? I think cassettes were like, well, my first record, Joe, you could tell, you could tell me what yours were, but mine was Elton John's Greatest Hits. Volume one, I think it was 1976, 77, around that time. When he had I was a greatest also hits a, album at that point? Well, he had a greatest hits album in 76 and 77. Really? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was eight track. And then, of course, LPs. And then cassettes were what? Early 80s. Um, 83, 84, or something it, like what? that? Yeah. I, I could have yeah, sworn maybe, it was earlier. Maybe a little bit before that. I, you were right about eight track, though, because we had a, we had a 76 Cougar. And from the factory, it came with an eight-track player in it. I mean, and, big and old was, things. Oh yeah, yeah. And then, and you, right, and, they, and it would have that click, you know, that skip every time it would change tracks, and it, 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 they sounded okay, but th there were issues with it, you yeah. know. But uh, yeah, and, and cassettes it, later, yeah. It's funny totally. that you mention uh, being able to watch drummers today because I, I specifically recall my the first time being able to fill, figure out a lick in a song that for months, probably even a year, had just baked my brain. And it was from Subdivisions by Rush. Yeah. And it's in that bar where he kind of goes from the... And he's, got, he's doing an offbeat on the bell of the ride cymbal and riding the opposite with his, the hi-hat with his hand. And I could not figure out, listening to it, what the hell he was doing. Yeah. And then yeah. finally... They had like um, a Rush Chronicles VHS tape that we had gotten a hold of, and they had the Rush, uh, the Subdivisions music video on there, and it actually showed him how he did that. And I was like, "That's how he does it, man!" Yeah. So it's, <laughs> you're so right. It's so helpful. I mean, when we were, I was listening to all kinds of stuff back then before you know before computers and all that, and and it, it was really tough. And I figured out 
one time I figured out a way to, you know, record from vinyl over to tape and at seven and a half speed. And then you play it at three and three quarter speed. <laughs> so it would go real slow. And I could, oh, okay. The left, right, left, left, right. You know, and, and figure yeah. out but what a pain in the ass it was, you know, now yeah. to be able to watch videos. And I mean, you can record them and you can, you can, you know, pause them, you can stop and go over it again. And uh, it's not fair. They have, <laughs> I, they do it. They do have an advantage, but we had quite the imagination, and there was so much there was so much romance in the music business because we would wait in line outside record stores for records to come out, and then the band would sign, and then we would look at the liner notes, and we would just dream about things. And now they don't even have liner notes anymore. Right. right. I think that's coming back, though. I think that's going to make a comeback. Yeah. It would be nice. It would be nice. Well, you know what? What I think about when I think about people are like, "Wow, you got a chance to play with like Garth Brooks and Ludacris and Brian Adams." I'm like, "Yeah, those were all great experiences, but they were a result of having this super solid relationship with with my 20 year relationship with Jason Aldean." And it seemed like Joe Walsh was your kind of like hinge pin, where that was your guy, and as a result, you were able to cultivate relationships with the Eagles and Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and that relationship grew into other things. Am I right in kind of saying that? that he was yeah, your first? It, it, it's funny how that, that uh, Joe Walsh was the tree trunk, and then all these branches, you know, grew yeah. from that. Um, I mean, it, it's weird how things happen, and, uh, you know, when I, when I do um, – when I do speaking events, you know, a lot of the questions is, you know, how did you do this? How, how did that come about and all that? And, you know, that, it, you know, it, it's so different. Every, every gig you get is, is it, it's just such a wide network uh, thing that you go through and, you know, you have to be at the right place at the right time. I mean, that's always been in effect, yeah. you know, you have to be at the right place at the right time. And then you have to really play good and, and, you know, play like you mean it. And that's the one thing that's so old school that I learned from my dad that he said, you know, he said, you're going to go out in this world and you're going to play music for a living. He says, whether there are 10 people there, you've heard this before, whether there are yeah. 10 people there or 10,000, you put on the show, you play a good show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and th that actually got me gigs because I, I was playing at some dive with 20 drunk guys in there and, you know, and somebody shows up and, and, you know, two days later, I get a phone call. It's, it's a really great gig because they mm -hmm. like what they heard. And so, you know, I always, you know, look up and thank my dad for that because he, he, he that was an impression he left with me that, you know, no matter what, you know, t those 10 people paid a dollar to get in, you give them a show. Or, yes. you know, 20,000 paid 300, you give them a show. Doesn't matter, you know. And so, um, but you're right about the whole thing with Joe um it can and same with Jason I think same with you you know I mean the thing with Joe is that you know we'd be in the studio and right next door to us Stephen Stills was making a record right and he'd come wow. in to listen because they knew each other and actually Stephen Stills sat in the control room when Joe Walsh was doing the vocal to Rocky Mountain Way and he was sitting there and he you could tell he was talking under his breath about you know he should, he should sing it again. He should do, you know, do another one, do another take, do another take. And, and the producer finally had to tell him, hey, you know, you can sit there. And shut up. Shut up. <laughs> shut up. Let shut us up. do our jobs. <laughs> and so, but, uh, you know, now he's a good guy. We, we loved him. And, and so because he was in the room and he watched me work and actually at the time, uh, he grabbed our bass player as well. And Stephen came to talk to us and said, you know, uh, when you're done with this project, why don't you come make a record with me and we'll go do some gigs. You know, and then, then from that, you know, then Neil Young like that, and then, then you're there. And then, you know, back in the Colorado days, that's when we started with Joe. There was a band that Tommy Bolin had, mm. and the late Tommy Bolin, and his bass player was Stanley Sheldon. And Stanley Sheldon played with Peter Frampton. And when they lost their drummer, they needed a drummer to fill in and Stanley called me. It, it's all this, it, it's, you know, the six degrees of separation in rock and roll is so true. And, um, you, you have to be, um, try to be the best you can be at on your game man, all the time and be, you know, nice to get along with it. <laughs> yeah, and, totally. Uh, and, and, you know, and smile and have fun. And, um, uh, people remember that, you know, they remember your playing, of course, but they really remember if you, you know, 
you were you you know you, your personality was matched your playing you know and it should you know and um uh you know that doesn't mean that we don't get mad or get you know in bad moods because we all do but you know I, I hope that most musicians love playing as much as me and you do. And, yeah. and when we're playing, we're smiling, man. It, it's, it's, oh. we can't help it. Even if things are all screwed up and the monitors sound like shit and, and you, you, you know, your drums aren't working so well tonight and they don't sound so good. You're still smiling. You're having a good time. Absolutely. People see that. They see that and um, they want, they want to be part of that, you know? Yeah. It's like when you're playing the, um, the Grand Ole Opry and the, 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 you know, the wedge is all steel guitar and you're like, what is this? This is not going to help me. And you're playing on Eddie Bear's drum set and he's got the ride cymbal over here above the hi-hat and you're like, who cares? Here we go. I'm playing the Grand Ole Opry. Let's do yeah. this. That's you know? perfect. Absolutely. But, but I've seen you play. I've seen you play many times and you play with a childlike abandon and you're super sweaty and passionate and happy to be back there and you get a great tone and you just play like a young, young man that's at the front end of his career that's so excited to do about what's ahead of him. You, you're never going to be the guy that mails in a performance and your career is reflected that it's really great. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm glad you said it because I, I need to keep hearing that because I want to always, you know, kind of always try to do that. I don't know how else to do any other way to do it other than, you know, I, that's the way you do it. Most musicians are like that. Once in a while you get a guy that's never going to be happy. <laughs> but yeah. but um, most musicians that I know are, they're just thrilled. That's why we're all kind of so bummed out right now because we're not able to get out there and do what we do. And uh, it's really, really hard to deal with because um, uh, it, it, it's 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 the blood it's our blood of life and it's, it's what we do and um, uh, d taking this taken away from us during this this time uh, uh, with this virus and everything just heartbreaking man you know and um, you know besides the fact that we need to make a living it's it's also the emotional end of it you know and. Um, um, It'll be it'll be back, you know, and we'll be back out there, you know, uh, uh, complaining about the the room. <laughs> yeah, where's the Fiji? Where's this isn't Fiji? Yeah. I said <laughs> I said cold water. Um, well, you know that that whole thing, that spirit that shines through, you, um, is an amazing thing. And the kids at the School of Rock got to experience that. We were doing that Drummers Weekend at the School of Rock, and we're so fortunate that Angie and Kelly McCrite are our sponsors. They're our title sponsor of this show. And the School of Rock is all about music education. I'm a product of music education. I know you are, Joe. Um, yeah. Jim has, you know, big product of music education, and so we really appreciate what that what they're doing. There's 250 School of Rock locations in the world. World. The ones in Nashville and Franklin are top-notch, top-rated, cranking out great musicians. And parents, if you want to send your, your kids to learn a musical instrument, even if they're not going to turn out to be professional musicians, they learn so much about teamwork and working in a group and being able to take direction and being able to show up on time. And it's just a really great thing. So, Jim, we got two email addresses. Tell Angie and Kelly that we sent you. And what are they? Franklin at schoolofrock.com and Nashville at schoolofrock.com. We love the School of Rock, so thank you for supporting us and everybody reach out and support them. And I think that in Nashville, they're back to um, social distance music making with masks. So wear your mask and uh, get that six foot, uh, it's like two yardsticks, and then you just jump in, play some music. What's mm -hmm. up, Jim? So there's a, uh, I'm looking at the, the discography and it feels like I'm looking at a uh, playlist, a set of music that I used to play on I-95 in uh, Danbury, Connecticut, a radio station I used to work for. Sure. Because we played a lot of this music uh, back this in the This is day. the sound of the 70s and 80s right here. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is the this soundtrack. This is classic rock. So, and then we get to the <laughs> 90s. We come to a little bit of an out of left field kind of approach here with a Zach Wilde album, which I want to say I, I really enjoyed listening to and Republica, which is very yeah. industry. Interesting. Is that the ready to go album? Uh, I believe so. The Zach Wilde album was just tons of fun. It, it was, was wild. A, that was it a good was album. Out, it was completely crazy. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I mean, I, 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 Never met Zach, and uh, I've heard him play a million times. And um, 
uh, his manager was uh, our manager at the time, so he pulled me into the gig, and uh, we recorded in L.A. And uh, I, I liked him right off. Since the day I met him, I liked him immediately because he <laughs> was just—he's exactly what I thought he was going to be, just like kind of a wild man, and just but but just a, a, a kind kind soul inside all that craziness, and a, a, a nice, beautiful person. And um, but man. He, he had two Marshall stacks in the studio. Nobody records with two Marshall stacks in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to break the windows out of that joint. But, He's um, got to feel it, you know? Oh, man, was he intense in the studio, but incredible to, to record with. And that album um, uh, is, is a really good album. <laughs> and um, uh, that was uh, one of the, my favorite recordings of all my life was making that album with Zach Wilder. Really that was fun. a good album. I remember yeah. listening when it came out. I just, I, I wore it out. I got to uh, check yeah. that out, guys. Yeah. The, yeah, uh, it's the really other good. One, the Republica, I, I was in a cover band that played out around that time, and we actually played that song, Ready to Go. That was a fun song to play, man. Yeah. Really oh, yeah. Good song. Jim's a little younger than us, Joe. You know, he's, That's he's, okay. You know, That's okay. You know, not by much, dude. Come on. <laughs> I know. It's all, it's all, hey, I'm 50 next Saturday. Yeah. All right. Not so right. I'm going out, to, going out to the Joshua Tree, man. I'm going to look at the uh. stars for three nights. And I had LP send me a couple of hand drums, so I'm going to teach Kara how to play a djembe. And we're going to jam on djembes and just, like, tr zone out out there. And I got one of those beautiful little Dharma drums. It's like a, it's like a hand drum made of metal. It's like a tongue drum, you know, oh, and it's, cool. it's African with mallets, and it's very meditative. So I'm really looking forward to this, you know. You get, you got to take some peyote and stuff, and uh, not peyote, you know, but we'll, you know, we'll probably do some whatever you know Californians do. <laughs> a little bit of an <laughs> Californians, <entourage> the <laughs> little Californians, man. So Are Joe, you you've probably it? done. Where, what's that? Are you tenting it? No, we we rented a beautiful Airbnb. Oh, that's that's cheating. I know, but uh, yeah. you know, we're not outdoor people. <laughs> <laughs> I am not an outdoor person. Um, so, Joe, you've done so many interviews over the years. So I, I want to avoid some of the most commonly asked questions. But things that come to mind are we were talking off camera about right now you were supposed to be doing a 50th anniversary tour with Joe Walsh? Uh, no, uh, it was um, uh, uh, the, we, the first show was the 50th anniversary of the Kent State University tragedy. Yes. That was May 4th, 1970. And so May 4th, 2020 was 50 years. And we were going to play uh, the whole weekend. They had this big uh, memorial thing at, uh, up at Kent State here. And um, uh, that was going to be the first show of 50-some dates all summer that yeah. got canceled, you know, like everybody else's dates. And, um, yeah, bummer. I mean, just like, man. It, it, and we were all ready to go with re – we were set up for rehearsal. I uh, had a great, uh, I had a really great vintage kit uh, laid out for the, for that one gig. And um, uh, we were all really excited to do it. And then all of a sudden, uh, you remember now this was May 4th. So when all this happened, like early March, right? We're mm -hmm. thinking, well, hell by May 4th, this, this thing will be, you know, it'll be, we'll be fine. Right. And that's what they told us up at, Kent State they go well it, it's kind of iffy but it's looking like it's going to be a, it's going to be a go you know yeah. and we're, so we we figured that and then all of a sudden it got worse and worse and worse and by I would say by mid no by April 1st we looked at the situation we went it ain't ha this ain't happening this is no way we're going to play a show in in a month you know right. so uh but yeah that was um yeah, sad but true. <laughs> sad but true. Um, well, yeah, we're going to get back to this. I mean, we're as humans, we are community creatures, and we love to gather around the watering hole and be entertained, and that's our responsibility is to help people forget their problems for a little. Like, it'll come back. It definitely sure will. will. Oh, Absolutely. so Jim just texted me, and he said, Rich, don't forget about the misspelled Italian words. Mispronounced. So need, <laughs> yes, mispronounced. So, Jim... Yes. Take it away. Okay. Um, typically, and then this kind of started out when we were trying to, you know, we wanted to get a proper pronunciation of your last name because I would imagine you get a, a variation from people who just don't know, right? 
You know, what's funny is, you're right, but it, what's funny is there's a lot of Italians in New York. And anytime I do any talks or, you know, interviews or what have you from people in New York, they always get it right because they're used to probably being yelled at for not right. getting it right. But, <laughs> uh, that, but they get it right. And uh, as far as my last name goes, they're, they're, they're pretty good at it. Well, you, you're also competing with, you know, a very prominent celebrity out there uh, from several years ago, Dick Vital. So, that's, that's, yeah, I know. And he didn't even put the E on the end. Right. Yeah. But you have that. You got Vitali, Vitali, you know, but it's Vital. It, right? It's Vitali. Which made me think of, we were watching The Sopranos, when was it? Uh, a couple of years ago. And they kept, you know, that yeah, everybody who wants to be Italian wants to go to an Italian restaurant and ask for the gabagool, right? <laughs> they even did it in an office episode where Michael Scott says, I'll take the gabagool. And then yeah. you're kind of looking at him like, okay, but, and it's funny because I, and it's funny after this, I went to an Italian friend of mine and I said, do you know that Gabagool is actually Capicola? And he goes, really, dude, I'm Italian. <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, that's right. You are. <laughs> um, but things like, you know, okay, I'll spell out the word G R A Z I E. G R A. Z R E. I don't. I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, it's uh, it, people. I think would say grazie. Oh 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 oh. Uh, I thought I was saying I was relating to it as food. Right. These are well, just we'll, words. We'll get to that. Okay. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Apparently, it's with an e sound, not an e sound. But another one is B R U S C H E T T A. That's a bruschette. Bruschette. <laughs> bruschette. Bruschette. P R O S C I U T T O. That's not prosciutto, is it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but a lot of people say prosciutto. No. <laughs> now, does spaghetti have a strong T or a D sound? Spaghetti. Spaghetti, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of it. <laughs> well, what do you think, Rich? The audio might shift just a little bit, so I'm picking up this handheld. Usually, I'm wearing a wireless mic, but no. for some reason, my computer is dying, so I got to charge it up a little bit. But um, what are some ones that we were talking about the other day? Um, how would you that, well? How would you pronounce G N O C C H I? Oh, Noki. Is it Nachi? No, it's no. Noki. No, no, no Noki, it's Noki is kind of like, isn't it? It's kind of like a ravioli, but not as sexy. It's, I prefer uh, ravioli. It's pronounced, if you're Italian, it's pronounced gnocchi. Yeah. Gnocchi. It's like a silent G, gnocchi. Okay? Yes. What it is, it's, it's like, yeah. it's like uh, uh, potato dumplings almost. It's, it's made with potatoes and and. and you know, and batteries. They're yeah. delicious. The, the one that they really, uh, I think the one, let me think, there's one that they really messed up. And Oh, I know what it is. Uh, this is the way most people call it. They say, manicotti. <laughs> can, I and, take a, can I take a crack at it? Yeah, babe, come on. Manicot. That's it. That's nice. It. <laughs> <laughs> See, when, when, when you're in an Italian restaurant and you're Italian and the, the people next to the table over you go, I think I'll have the manicotti. <laughs> we all, you're you're look over him like, <laughs> you give him a Joe Pesci look, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, what, my God. Did you just say what I think you said over there, lady? Yeah. <laughs> Jim does some pretty good impressions. He really does. That is good. Uh, That's good. He does a pretty mean is... Christopher Walken. I, I occasionally it'll come out. It's crazy when you're talking about the carbonara or the calzone, calzone. <laughs> so you have uh, there's actually a, a a personality on the cooking channel, and she's hot. She's always showing her uh, her girls rack of lamb, her rack yeah. <laughs> of lamb, and she was making desserts that involved like some orange slices and things of that nature and a certain kind of cheese that's Italian that starts with an M and she would always 
speak normally. She had a very good diction and everything and, and really good way about her. And as soon as this one word would come up, she would just zing the crap out of him. And it was Marscapone. And she would say it just like that. It was hilarious. <laughs> Marscapone, I think is how Yes. It. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you have a lot of Italian words in music, though, Rich, don't you? Oh, uh, you know, everybody oh, yeah. thinks, yeah, like they, they say, well, oh, the Germans and the Viennese and the French were so responsible for classical music. But whatever you talk about, accelerandos and, and uh, uh, all that stuff, leg largo, legato, staccato, Bellissimo. it's all Italian. Yeah. Crescendo. Crescendo. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, Joe, so you had that coming up, but this is all going to come back. We're going to get back around again. What are some memories looking back? Now, you have this book, this wonderful book that you signed for me and you gave to me when I met you at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. We were both teaching in North Hollywood at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. I think it was maybe like six, seven years ago. And you were so sweet. You gave me a copy of your book, Backstage Pass. And um, it's a great, tell us a little bit about what, your personal life and how have you stayed married to the same woman all these years? That's incredible. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm a lucky man, I guess. You're uh, very lucky. Very lucky. Uh, we, we celebrate uh, 47 years this uh, next month. Next month, 47 years. Yeah, my yeah. 52 years, baby. All right. All right. But, um, uh, and my, my lovely wife, Susie, she's the one who got me to write that book. I mean, I, I've been on bus tours like you and, and, you know, after gigs, you, you know, you hang out, you have something, eat, you, you know, sit around, you don't always go to bed right away and you sit around and talk. And, you know, in rock and roll, it, like everybody, we, you know, there's a lot of, you know, if we played with different bands, there's always stories, there's always road stories. And, and remember wins, you know, and, and um, so I, I would always end up, I guess it's because of the characters I work with, but I always had these really funny stories about these guys, you know, and, and they always wanted to hear them. And so, um, you know, eventually the guys in the, in the bus would say, man, you got to write a book. You know, this, this stuff, is, you got to write this, you got to document this, right? And I always was like negative about it because I was like, nah, I don't want to write a book. I'm a drummer, man. I don't want to write a book. And... <laughs> And, you know, and it's like, so I go home and I was telling my wife that, you know, these guys are bugging me to write a book. And then she goes, yeah, you know, you got to write a book. You got some good stories. I said, OK, I give up. Let's write a book. Uh, she did all the work. All I had to do for three years, we uh, she just put the cassette on or whatever recording device we had. And we, I, she said, just tell me stories, talk about this. And then we went through chronological the years, you know, and then we went literally through a box the size of a washing machine of 10,000 photos. Wow. And, and we, we picked out 750 photos for the book. And, um, and you know, it's funny <clears throat> when you look at a photo, the photos really helped in the chronological of this book because, you know, you think, when the heck was that? What that guy? Remember that guy? What tour was that? And then you, you, as soon as you start looking through photos, you'll see, you'll see someone in that photo and there he is. He's got a Crosby, Stills and Ash jacket on. And it says, tour, this so-and-so named tour. And you go, ah, I know when that was 19, you know, 1982 or something, you know. And so looking through all these photos and... Um, so we put this thing together. It took three years, but um, it there's no it's a no dirt book. I don't I don't like those kind of books. All these guys are there. Are, all these people in this book are my friends. I, I, you know, sure. I, and, and and you know, this is a no dirt. It's a hilarious book. And it's nothing but funny stuff, and um, I mean, really funny stuff. And it's the kind of stuff that, um, like I say, when you get on a bus after a gig. Uh, and you you know he's just sitting around just come you know you know winding down and you you tell funny stories sometimes and um tell jokes or funny stories or whatever and it's the accumulation of uh you know you know 30 40 years that that that's a, that's a it's a lot of good stories and it is hilarious and yeah a lot of these publishers they want the dirt you know uh, Kenny Aronoff came out with his book. Carmine came out with his book. Lib just put out his book. I ordered a nice signed copy from our friend Lib. I'm waiting for it to arrive. But they, they always say, you know, the publisher wants a little bit of sex, drugs, and rock and roll in there, you know, to kind of make it sexy. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's you know, it's no, that it's pressure. True. I, I, 
after after I got done with the, uh, the, the long run tour with the Eagles, my phone rang nonstop because these writers were calling me and wanted, you know, what can you tell me about the Eagles? And what about the, t-? I said, I can't tell you nothing. I'm telling you, they're the best guys in the world, the greatest band that ever lived by. You know? yes. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to give you, they want all this inside sleazy crap. No, I'm not going to do that, you know, and, and, and not that there is even in, in existence, but I'm just saying, uh, I don't do that. And I don't, I don't care for those books really. I mean, everybody's got a right to write whatever they want, but, uh, I had a ball writing the funny stuff, and, and, and we got really great reviews because of that, because it's mm-hmm. funny. And, I mean, I, uh, I got a guy write to us, and, and he, when he was done reading it, he gave it to his 10-year-old daughter. Here, you want to learn about rock and roll? For, for us, that was fantastic that a 10-year-old girl could read our book, and, and it was cool. You know, nice. Wasn't... It's like a clean comic. It is. You take it, the it, family it, to see some clean comedy. Like Mad and, Magazine. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 and so during your career, you've got to do some double drumming, right, with Ringo and Don Henley, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, a lot of that, and yeah, it was fun. Because I remember you being at the camp, and you had this cool little X hat. So people that aren't musicians, it's like the hi hat symbol is usually like you see the drummer crossing, and like Ringo will be spreading the butter on the hi hat. It's right by the snare drum, but. Sometimes drummers, they'll take the hi-hat symbols and they'll put it over on the right side, but where the right symbol would be so they can raise their left hand up higher and just be a little bit more showy. And I was like, Joe, I love the sound of these hi-hats. That's a really cool thing. And you're like, oh, yeah, those are the Ringo hats, man. They're not really supposed to leave the house. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but, um, so what are, some, what are some other awesome war stories over the years, like favorite tours, favorite recordings? And there's other things I want to ask you about. There's so many things I want to talk about. Your son being a musician and all this stuff. I think, my, you know, we had talked about the Zach Wilde album. That was a, a, such a memorable album. But the, my favorite album of, of all time to be recorded was probably uh, the, the Walsh album called uh, But Seriously, Folks. That's the one that had Life's Been Good on it and all that. <sighs> and and that, that album is just a masterpiece. And um, it, it just, Joe was just on top of the world of writing. And um, he was, at the time, he had written a bunch of songs. I wrote some with him for the Eagles. And uh, he had written a bunch of songs. And, you know, the Eagles only used a few of them because they're all writers, you know. And so he had all these songs left over, not like they're leftovers. I mean, they were really good songs. And, um, and so we recorded that album. And um, remember, the Hotel California was 1976. Well, we did uh, But Seriously, folks, in 1978. So uh, it, it, the songs he brought to that album were songs that he had brought to the Eagles and that they, they had enough songs because they're, they're all writers. They're all great writers in that band. Yeah. Now. And so um, uh, he had some killer songs. And... Um, so that was my favorite all-time album because it was so musical and it ended up being selling the most copies and all that sort of thing. But uh, uh, it, it was a brilliant record and um, life's been good. I mean, it's, it's, it's classic. It's, it's t- yeah. to this day. I mean, that was a long time ago we recorded that. And um, so th- that was my favorite um uh, album I, I, I did and um, th- there was a lot of them that you know you know you made tons of records that they're all special you know but there's yeah. that one that's even a little bit more special you know and yeah uh, you know that yeah, was really great working with Ringo in the studio was, was I mean I'm, I'm sitting there going that's Ringo's that's a Beatle sitting over there it's like i mean that's what inspired you to do music is watching the ed sullivan show I, you're I, looking I, at this guy spreading the butter with the ludwigs I know. And then you're in a room with the guy and you manifest these things in your life it's incredible that was an incredible moment because um being 14 years old watching them on the ed sullivan show and they were so big it was you know it was beatlemania it was, they were bigger than life and and you know some years go by and all of a sudden, you're in the same room with him playing, making music with the guy. And it's like, wow, that, that was a, really an amazing moment. And um, uh, I mean, uh, it, we become friends, but I'm still a fan forever, you know. Sure. We're, we're friends, and, and I'm a fan. But um, and he's a wonderful guy to work with. He's so funny. And so, he's just so there's a guy that I think he just turned 80. 
and he had his 80th birthday the other day. <clears throat> that guy has more energy than all of us put together at 80 years old. He jumps around on the stage like you know, like he's like 20. And yeah, uh, his shows are so fun. And um, but um, yeah, uh, you know, there's been like I say that every album to me was there was they were all special to me, but there was one that was really special. That was the Joe Walsh record. Yes. Now, did you want to share that story about how um, life's been good to me so far was kind of like a Frankenstein uh, tape of sure. different riffs? It's a, it's a great story. Um, Joe uh, would come into the studio. This is typical Walsh. He would come into the studio and he'd say, yeah, I got this song. It really wasn't a song. It was just a, a bit, you know, a riff or something. You know, and, he goes, and, you know, it would turn into a great song. But I mean, so he came into that session and he said, hey, I got this song. It's, it's kind of like a, like a Rolling Stones thing. Da, 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 right? And well, yeah, that's cool, you know. And then, and then, and then he had this uh, kind of uh, Jimmy Page kind of like uh, Zeppelin kind of a 12-string acoustic thing. Da, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, that's a nice song. And then there, and then there was this, and he, and he loves re reggae. So he brought in this riff that went dun 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 ding dang dun 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 and that's the reggae song. So and then we had this little sequencer thing. So in other words, four songs, right? Four bits, right? Four riffs. And not one of them were complete, you know. Uh, but that that was okay. That's typical of Joe, you know, the way he would bring stuff in. And um so we recorded all these riffs and all these licks. And uh, we really didn't know what to do with them because that's all we had were these each individual riffs. But we recorded over and over a bunch of them. And uh, it, it had to have been Friday because uh, Bill Simzik, the producer, said, guys, take the weekend off and I'll see you on Monday. So we cut all this stuff on Friday and then uh, we take the weekend off and uh, we come back Monday. And we get into the studio around noon, and the and, uh, producer, Bill Simzik, he said, sit down. And we said, uh, and he was really excited about something. Well, what the heck's going on, Bill? And he sat down, and he hit play on the, on the machine. And it was uh, without vocal, of course, because that wasn't done yet. But it was life's been good as we know it now, like, you know, seven, eight minute long The thing. instrumental. He, he put together all those different pieces and made one song out of it. It was like brilliant. I mean, it was like, we always called him, he was our George Martin, you know, and because uh, he was that intricate and important to all the records we made. He, he's fabulous, fabulous producer and um, couldn't play a stitch of music, but boy, what a set of ears he had. He could hear things that we would have never dreamed of hearing. And uh, that's what a producer does, you know. It's funny because I've played that song whenever I played to the radio, I would play whatever song would come on and, you know, jam right. along with it. And the radio station I worked for, be it little did it, I, I, I know at the time I was going to work for him, but back when I was playing drums in my parents' basement, I would play to whatever was coming out. And when that right. song came on, man, that song would frustrate me <laughs> because that reggae part would trip me up every single time, man. It's, and, it's, uh, it's, it's funny because, if you once you mess with it a little bit, it's it's really not that difficult. But For when me you it first, was. <laughs> well, when you first jump in on it, it, it it's a little challenging. Yeah. You know, when you first jump in on it, but a lot and of fun live. That song live is still fun to this day. And it's I curious, get to, though, I get to start it. That's the way the song starts with drums. That and, song. I mean, the way you're describing how it was put together, now it makes sense because it's like, what the hell were they thinking in the studio putting this thing together? But it, the way it was put together, it yeah. sounded like one conception. It sounds like it was conceived. That's how it was written. Yeah. And it actually works <clears throat> together beautifully. It really does. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those freaky things. And that was back in the day when they were cutting and splicing tape. Cutting two-inch tape, which drove us crazy. It was like we were scared to death when he'd bring that razor out. But he was oh, really good gosh. at it. He was real good at it, you yeah. know. Not an enviable project, that's for sure. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, uh, editing today is it's, it's oh, what a totally piece of cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's. I was on the like tail end of that in radio. I, I I cut my teeth cutting and splicing tape in radio 
Uh, oh, yeah. It was only quarter inch tape. It wasn't two inch. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was. Uh, it's something back then. The way the editing. I mean, and, and everybody did it, and it was like you know, you just had to have nerves of steel, and uh, you had to have a lot of guts, you know, to cut a two inch tape, you know. So, all right, this is a perfect time to take a quick break. And be right back. The Rich Redman Show. We'll be right back. Well, our big tagline has been inspiring kids to rock on stage and in life. We changed it actually to inspiring the world to rock on stage and in life because when kids are here, they learn so much more than music. They learn how to be on a team. They learn responsibility. They learn to take responsibility for their actions. They learn to organize their time. And we try to teach them, you know, not to be that person that nobody wants to be on a tour bus with. <laughs> Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. Now, Jim, what have you always wanted to ask a seasoned rock drummer? Well, uh, first off, Dan Fogelberg is one of the prominent artists that you've played with over the years. One of the, my most favorite songs he's ever done is Leader in the Band, Leader of the Band. Right. Leader of the Band, yeah. Amazing, amazing song. The harmonies on it are just amazing. And, but it's funny because it's such a soft, you know, soft rock song. Yeah. Uh, was it a challenge to kind of play that and record it? It, w it, was, it was recorded in, in, like almost live the way mm -hmm. he did it. And, um, uh, and then his, his, that song, it, it was a tribute to his dad. And um, every night when he'd play that live, I, I, I could never get through it. I mean, I, I'd be in tears the way he did it. And he was able to do that every night. And it just, it almost like he was singing about a song that somebody else wrote about their dad. Yeah. And then not that, with, that he didn't have feelings about it. It was that he was so professional about it. And he wanted to, the performance to come over so well, uh, go over so well that, he just put his heart and soul into it. And every night he would sing that song live and we'd be like, you know, how does he do that? It's, it's like, you know, it's like speaking at a, a, a loved one's funeral or something and how difficult that is. And he did it in front of, you know, 10,000 people every night, you know, sure. pretty amazing. Yeah. It was a beautiful song. Yeah. That was one of my Man. Favorites. Joe, tell us about your son. He's a musician as well. Yeah. My son rocks. He's uh, he's uh, uh, crazy about it all. He grew up obviously in in the family that you know my family that was, we were surrounded by music, and he was on tours with me. And as a young kid, you know, uh, Graham Nash used to have him come up when he, he was like ten, have Joey come up and uh, play tambourine on Teacher Children, and uh, you know, and and he got the bug early in life, and. Uh, and he's uh, he's rocking and rolling. He just did a video for um, uh, we endorse uh, warm audio uh, gear, and uh, he just did a video for it, and and it's almost at a million views already. Yeah, and uh, nice. he, he's doing good. He he act, he's a musician, but he actually did the video too. He's a videographer as well, and he's really good at all that stuff. And uh, that's where he, he's my my teacher of all di all things digital. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I taught him about, you know, tape and analog and he, he taught me about digital. So, um, yeah. Well, that's a cool really? thing. That's keep it in the, keep it in the, in the family, man. Yeah. So, you, you know what I always tell people, I say, look at, if you're living in Nashville long enough, you're going to write a song. And if you're hanging out in Hollywood long enough, you're going to do a little bit of acting. And I was so impressed one night I was sitting it must have been 2016, 2017. I'm on my black leather couch. I got the big screen there. This movie, Ricky and the Flash, comes on, and you're playing drums in the movie. I think you had a couple speaking parts, too. I actually got to say a few words. <laughs> With Meryl Streep. With Meryl Streep, I know. Tell, I know. Tell us about that experience. Well, I did a couple of videos with, um, with Neil Young, and the, uh, the um, director of those videos rock videos were, um, was, uh, uh, Jonathan Demi. Mm -hmm. Jonathan Demi also did, uh, 
Silence of the Lambs, and he did Philadelphia, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of big movies. And so, um, uh, and the bass player in that movie that played in that band, in the movie band, was Rick Rosas. He, he passed away not too long ago, but mm -hmm. he uh, was uh, friends with me as well. And we both, actually, me and Rick played with Walsh for a while. Anyway, so I get a call from Jonathan Demi one night, and, and, and I don't know Jonathan Demi. I mean, he was the director of a a, a video, but I don't know him, you know, and he called me. I answered the phone and, is this Joe? I went, yeah. He said, this is Jonathan Demi. I went, get out of here. Who is this? <laughs> so, you know, anyway, long story short, and he had me go to New York and he just thought that um, they were looking for a uh, a guy about my age that was, uh, could be in a, in a, a rock band that plays in these bad, bad, like dives like clubs and stuff and for a uh a wannabe rock star female singer and that's the story anyway and uh in the movie and so he said that um do you want to be a drummer in a movie with meryl streep <laughs> hell no i don't want to do that you know <laughs> <laughs> and rick springfield and rick springfield that's right rick's a great guy and um so yeah, uh, you know, I'm not an actor. You know, you're 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 an actor. I'm not an actor, but uh, uh, but I only had to be a drummer, so I was able to do it. You know, wasn't, I love uh, it. Didn't have to. It wasn't a stretch for me to to play me. You know, to be. Well, that's a, it's just a cool story, man. It was a cool story. A cool we talked story. about that last summer. Yeah, we we got to do, it. Was fun. I'll tell you the most fun thing about it. It, it was the whole thing was great, but the experience of seeing. Uh, I mean, this was this was like the A team. I mean, you got Meryl Streep and and. And and the people that surrounded this movie it was it was a Sony production. It was a big time movie, so you get a, you you get to be a fly on the wall to see how the the big timers do it. And and that that was really an experience. To it's crazy the way they do stuff like that. I mean, it's like long, I twelve hour days. Yep. And I mean, it is it's brutal, man. And the crew just they they, they I don't know when they slept. You know, they work so hard. They really work hard and. Um, uh, it was really fun. Um, uh, there was a lot of there was a there was several outtakes though that I wish had made it to the cut because I thought they were really cool. But uh, you yeah. know, I'm not the director. You, know? you got to keep it under two hours somehow. Something's got to right. end up on the floor, you know. <laughs> but I, you know, I just you just inspire me so much, man. I mean, just the fact that you know you can teach the way you do, you can speak the way you do, you can rec you have a recording pedigree, you have a touring pedigree, you're an author now. And, you know, not only that, you can play flute and keyboards and compose and you have three solo albums, Roller Coaster Weekend, Plantation Harbor, Speaking and Drums. I encourage all of our listeners to check those things out. Did you ever um, tour as a solo artist fronting a band on with those records? Um, I did. Uh, in 1975, my first solo record, uh, Roller Coaster Weekend, uh, I put a band together and uh, we actually went out and toured with uh, the Jay Giles band. Yeah. And, uh, and John Entwistle's Ox and Ox band, and John Entwistle, wow. and um, uh, we did a whole uh, like uh, uh, U.S. and Canada tour, and uh, it was a ball. We had a good time. I tell you, man, the cover of that record, uh, a, a younger Joe Vitale. Uh, it, it's uh, wow. You look like you could have um, been in Saturday Night Fever with, uh, you know, you could have been with Travolta, man. You good looking so dude. Wow. Come on. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, so this is a portion of the show we call the random question of the day. And Jim is going to hit you with a random question of the day. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. Random right. question. Being that you're Italian and when I, I talk with Italian people and we talk about food, I naturally get hungry. So, the, you know, big surprise there. Um, what food have you never eaten but would really like to try? Okay. It's not Italian, right? <laughs> it's not Italian food. Um, honest to God, you'll probably laugh. Sushi. Oh, you never tried it? Really? Never. Wow. So, well, go out and do it. Yeah, the, the funny thing about sushi is that I'm cool with all of it. I'm not really crazy about Mm, a sea sponge because it's a little funny you feel like you're eating um what's who's that cartoon character that it's a sea sponge sea sponge spongebob you feel like SpongeBob. you're eating spongebob, SpongeBob yeah. yeah and then also um 
the octopus is such an intelligent, likable, friendly creature. Yeah. Um, that it, it's, they can be it's pretty been, mean. It, yeah, they're very, they can be very mean, but they're so hyper intelligent. It's like, yeah. I feel a little guilty eating the yeah. octopus. Have you, do you guys, uh, have you ever tried oysters? I'm not a big uh, oysters no. guy. I'll fry them. Mm-hmm. I'll fry them. Yeah. I try to avoid the Rocky Mountain oysters. Right. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Which are what, Rich? <laughs> For those who Tell don't know. Tell us about it, Rich. <laughs> bull testicles. Oh. oh Fried yes. bull testicles. Joe, it's funny. You mentioned, uh, you know, SpongeBob SquarePants. And, you know, are you guys familiar with the Frozen movies at all? Sure. Have you watched them? No. I can't say okay, I've but- watched them. Where you're familiar with the song Let It Go and everything. Yeah. That was a huge hit back in 2013. We've been watching, and this is going to have a point, I promise. We've been watching on Netflix, no, Disney Plus. They have a five episode series on the making of Frozen 2. And the wow. two people, it's a husband and wife team who write all the big hit songs. They wrote Let It Go. They wrote all the big songs in the first movie, and they were charged with writing all the songs in the second movie. And, Cha-ching. you know, What's that? Chiching. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, truly amazing. And um, it's really kind of been resonating with me as we're talking here how their stamp has been put on such a, a massive imprint of human history because I think it was the, the um, highest grossing animated movie of all time. Yeah. Two. yeah. Um, looking back at your discography, I mean, do you ever, you know, I would imagine that they look back on that and go, wow. That's pretty cool that we left our, our mark on just a massive impression of human history. And looking back on, I mean, do you ever let's just tune into a classic rock station and go down memory lane? I mean, and just kind of go, wow. Well, what yeah. A, what a run. It, 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 um, it's amazing sometimes that you hear a song and, and um, is recorded so long ago and you listen and go, wait a minute. Oh, I recorded that song. Oh, because there's, there's a lot of big hits that we've all been on, but there's also thousands of like you played on one cut on a record, right? And the record really didn't do so well, but mm-hmm. it, it was okay, you know. And um, and once in a while, uh, I've noticed that on like uh, with Sirius Radio and a lot of the stuff that they do, and um, uh, every once in a while I get, I'll hear something that oh man, I haven't heard that in years, and maybe never never on the radio, and and um, uh, it, it is it is interesting to hear them and and I mean I'm kind of used to hearing the big ones you know I mean, and that's always fun of course but but once in a while you'll you, they'll play something that was like really obscure you know obscure track and um, uh, I, I can't even remember the names of some of these tracks you know and and you hear them though and you remember of course that you know can recognize your playing and or whatever but um, uh, it's pretty it's fun. Yeah, you listen to classic rock and you're like, that's me, that's me, that's me, <laughs> me again. It's like, it's like Lonnie Wilson walking to, walking into a Nashville Publix and hearing himself on the overhead on any given time on a country station. Yeah, no uh, kidding. Talking about, yeah, Lonnie Wilson's 125 number, number one song yeah. hits he's played on. It's crazy. Oh, um, man. You know, it, it's funny because, I mean, you, you, you look at that kind of a thing and it's just it's just uh, amazing to me to, to be able to go in there. And, and, you know, for some of the deep cuts and the ones that maybe aren't as popular, is there a song that comes to mind that you are really proud of that maybe just wasn't as popular? Um, yes. Um, there's a song that me and Joe Walsh recorded with. We, we played on, uh, we did uh, John Entwistle's album. It's uh, John Entwistle's solo album. Uh, and it's called, the album's called Too Late the Hero. Wow. And the title cut, Too Late the Hero, is, is unbelievable how cool it is. And I'm so proud of that cut. It was just the three of us in London. And we, we played every, we pl- I played flute on it, piano and drums and timpani. Wow. Dope played all the synthesizers and guitars. And all. John Entwistle sang it and played bass, of course. And um, he he used me and Joe because he liked what we did as a team, but he also knew that we did more than just drums and guitar, you know? So he, and he needed 
that. And so that particular song, Too Late to Hero, it's a long piece, but it's a monster cut. It's, a, it's kind of slow and plotting, but it's beautiful. And uh, we're real proud of that. that. That was one that, and you, you probably never hear it on the radio. And you probably, you know, it's, it's one of those songs that, you know, the album didn't really uh, break any records or anything. It just, you know, it just, it was a good album though, but that one cut, it's a title cut. It's really cool. Yeah. Was Joe, who are, your, who are your Sorry. peers? I'm so, we haven't mastered this Zoom thing. You know? It's just, just okay. a slight delay. We got to raise I was our hands. Say, yeah, we're like, yeah. Um, who who are your 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 peers that you were coming up with? Like, in I'm I'm assuming it's the is it the Liberties and the Carmines and the like? Who are your the Bonham? Actually, you, it was a little earlier than that. It, it, as far as you know, the very early days, I, I you know I listened to a lot of Buddy Rich, and then I listened to a lot of Ringo God. and Hal Blaine. And then I listened to a lot of Bonham. And I, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite drummers in the 60s was, was Dino Donnelly. Oh, from, yeah. From the Rascals. And I mean, he was cool. Everybody wanted, and, and Liberty even says this, everybody wanted to be Dino Donnelly. Yeah. Because they had tons of hit records. And he, as a drummer, was, he was a great drummer. And he was just cool. He was just cool. And with his flipping the sticks and the twirling and and just the way he, his whole body language as a player if you ever watch old videos he was just really cool so everybody wanted to be dino Donnelli, and then all of a sudden john bonham <laughs> appeared and it was like okay and of course i love keith moon and um you know all the drummers you mentioned that came later and i loved all you know they were inspirational as hell but i mean ringo to me was was the song drummer he he played a song on them drums you know he, he just played the song he didn't he just play, play the song time. yeah he played he played the song he didn't just play time and um all the records that hal blaine made geez they, it's a, it's frightening when you see the wrecking crew movie and they show the list of credits oh my god those guys yeah, played every, every song and and um uh what's sad those guys didn't get a lot of credit because there were groups that they were the musicians and the, and because the guys in the band weren't good enough <laughs> to make the records yeah. and and, uh, uh, and they didn't get credit because the record companies didn't want people, the buyers, they didn't want them, the, the fans to know that your guys, you know, really didn't play on these records, you know, right. and it's sad because those, the guys in the record, those guys were fabulous musicians, you know, and so all the Hal Blaine stuff was fun to us do Ringo, John, uh, John Bonham, Dino Donnelly, old school was uh, Buddy Rich, of course. Um, then there was a slew of guys in, in the 70s. God, just tons of them. And, uh, of course, Keith Moon. And um, I always I mean, was a Charlie Watts fan, you know. And Possibly Russ Kunkel. Were you guys friends? Absolutely. Russ, yeah. Russ made a lot of it. I did a double drumming um, tour with Russ, uh, with Joe. It was it was fun, yeah. That yeah. was fun. Super cool. Oh my god. Well, Jim, wasn't this so fun? I mean, just so Absolutely. informative. Yeah. I mean, just really, just really, really inspiring. And uh, you know, it's just a testament, Joe, to to you know you being able to uh, manifest all your dreams and be able to inspire a future generation of people. And what happens when you combine talent and just an awesome personality and follow through through and hustle, man. So uh, it's just a Real and no sleep. To, to and no sleep. And no sleep. No sleep. <laughs> and no sleep. That's right, man. That's Is right. that a regret? Would you have gone back and gotten more sleep? No, no, less, <laughs> less, <laughs> less sleep. Well, let me I ask tell you, you what, you guys. I can't wait to do this in person with you. This, this, this virus. This sucks. This, this, sucks. this staying at home crap, man. I, I want to yeah. be around. I want to hang with my buds, man. You know. Love to yeah, meet you in sure. person someday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we Is definitely it? will. I, I remember talking about Ricky and the Flash and a lot of fun things. That, um, you you stopped out to uh, Blossom Music. So was it Blossom? Yeah, Blossom. Yeah. When, when we, 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 right there. Yeah, you were going to come to the show that night, and then we so we went to lunch, and we both ordered the same thing off the menu: a chicken salad on a croissant. I was like, yeah, we both have the same taste. Chicken, I can't pass up chicken salad. And then you got called. You had to fly to New York to play on a video game soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. You, you couldn't come to the show. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I'm bummed. And then I'm figuring, well, 
I'll, I'll catch you the next time around. And now is the next time around. It's no it, show. It right now, you know, yeah. oh if, if you had to do it all over again, if you had to go back and maybe drumming wasn't an option, what would you do? What would be, what would be, what's like a, what's a secret little passion hobby thing that you'd love to maybe make into a living? Maybe, I don't know, being a plumber or an electrician or something. No, I, I'll tell you what I would have done. Seriously. Um, I would have either been a cook cause I love to cook Yeah. and, or, uh, I would have, uh, I would have gotten into electronics cause I love working with electronics and stuff. And I, I mess around with it now and, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, but, uh, then again, I look, and I go, nah, music is what I need to do. But, yeah. Or, hey, Rich, uh, not too long ago on, on YouTube, Billy uh, Amendola from Modern Drummer, he put up that video. Remember when we were, we did that at, at, uh, dis, uh, round table discussion? Round table, yeah. With with Hal Blaine. Yeah. And, and you were there, and I was there, and Russ Kunkel, Jim Keltner. Remember John Robinson, guys? yeah. That's right, John Robinson and uh, uh, Alan White and uh, all them guys. That was the camp we did together. I don't, yeah, I don't think I, uh, I don't think I said much. I was letting the, those guys. You didn't, have their... you didn't say much, but a little bit. You did a little yeah. bit, but you remember that that round table thing? That was on. So fun. Was on, it was on uh, Facebook not too long ago. Oh yeah, I love that. Billy. Hard I love to believe. It. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> Oh, it'll be hard to believe that I didn't say much. Yeah. No, I got gotcha. you. It took a lot of restraint. Sorry. <laughs> took, oh, took, Jim knows me well. We've been working together here a good 12 years or so, and he knows me inside and out. He's kind of my muse. Good team. Good team. Thank you. For sure. Well, Joe, we really appreciate you having here, man. What's the plan for the next five years, man? What's, what, what's exciting? Uh, what are you working on? I, I'm just uh, – my, my – my drums are in the cases. My 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 suitcase are packed. Uh, I'm just like ready to fly out the door on tour, man. And Susie's like, "Yeah, go." Yeah, please, <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> Stop messing it, with your electronics and cooking. Get out of the house. Yeah, no, get out of here. You know, I mean, I think we're all in that same boat. I, I, I you know, I'll tell you what, Rich. When this thing settles down and and we get back to normal, I'll tell you what. <laughs> The first rock shows that we all do are going to probably be the greatest rock shows in the world. People are going to be so chomping at the bit to get out and rock and roll and sit in the seats. And you know what I'm saying? In other words, uh, it, it's going to be like no other concert. Imagine the first downbeat of the first song of the first concert in front of the crowd first for the first time for all this. It's going to be I, crazy. I can't uh, wait to go do blap. I know. Crash. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A count off for the first song in a big arena or something. Man, it's gonna. I can't wait. Something to look forward to. Have Definitely you guys seen how they're kind of adapting and pivoting with uh, the live playing? They're doing the drive-in concerts. Now? Yeah, uh, didn't Garth Brooks do that? Uh, Darius did it. Brad Paisley. Uh, yeah, Garth other Brooks guys. did one. Yeah. yeah. Well, he did. They broadcast his concert at drive-in movie theaters. That's but right. Yeah, that's right. Here at yeah. Nissan Stadium in Nashville, they actually set up a stage in the parking lot and had a live performance to people in their cars. In their cars. Wow. Yeah. Do you know that, Rich? I did not know that. I've yeah. been out here and uh, just sequestered in Los Angeles, I guess. I've been watching a lot of news, guys. I, I have never watched this much news in my life to find out what's going on with, with this virus. Well, that explains it's it. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> You don't know Stay what's safe. true and what's not. Stay safe, man. Don't go too far. The, the de you're going out in the desert. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yes, I am. And I even wrote I a song you. about it, guys. Wash your hands, don't touch your face. Wash <laughs> your hands, don't touch <laughs> your face. Wash <laughs> your hands, don't. So that's the and fun with that. And don't be a mask part. hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Joe, I really appreciate, man, your, your friendship and coming and joining us and sharing all your insights and gifts. And Jim, I, I appreciate your time and talent as always. And for you guys watching and listening, thanks for supporting The Rich Redman Show. Uh, give us a rating. Give us a five-star rating. It takes one second. Leave us a review. Tell all your friends about it. We're going to be here, and we'll see you next time. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, comment, and follow us at richredman.com forward slash listen.